Ladies and gentlemen, and everything else, I sit before you in shame. You're probably used to the integral stage having preposterous high-tempo intellectual introductions and fitting into categories of interview series we've pre-established, and none of that applies today. This conversation is impromptu, and I know almost nothing about the person I'm about to talk with. So what happened was I'd posted a meme of a white woman and man in bed. She's looking at him thinking he's probably thinking about other women, and he sort of is. He's thinking about how to get more gender and ethnic diversity into the online conversations he convenes, a classic intellectual white guy problem. I thought it was funny, not only because women tend to overinterpret the likelihood that men are thinking about women, but also because almost all the leading podcasters, conveners, and space holders in the extended liminal web communities, integral metamodernism, gay B, the intellectual deep web, that kind of thing, are earnest white males from Europe or North America who periodically ask themselves and each other why their ilk predominate in this space. Are they not being inviting enough? Is it something else? Are they idiots to worry about it? Is there something real to take into consideration here? Anyway, Naomi responded in a way that seemed like she was taking the question seriously or had something to add. And because this is partly about how to foreground women in meta-level online discussion spaces, I called her bluff and she answered and we're thrilled to have her here. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely was not bluffing. Uh, well, this is the proof. Yeah. So uh, I'm midway through um, a couple of pieces of writing. One of them is a book that I've been writing about anarchist hacker spaces and doing a bunch of interviews in different spaces and things like that, which have their own history of being way too white male for their own good. And an article that was originally designated for a journal but I'd missed that deadline because I'm in school full time studying math, um, which is, uh, yeah. So um, the article is basically called Citation as an Act of Creation. So when I, you know, <laughs> when I answered yes, indeed, why, you know, why indeed is it the case that like, how do we, how do we get the women? How do we get the black people in here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, and a lot um, pulling pulling resources from different different angles as well. So how do you how do you want to latch into this? We have I don't know. It's a very interesting question because I think it, you know in my mind the first thing I want to do is tease apart the 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 solipsistic ridiculousness of the question mm. uh, from the actual authenticity of what the question might point to. Right? Obviously, right. we want more. Uh, more authentic, but even just more technical diversity in a space can sometimes make that space more intelligent. And obviously there's lots of kind of voices. And if you're talking about these big picture ideas that are supposed to apply to everybody, it would be nice if there were more than just a couple types of people showing up to that conversation. Otherwise it seems to be completely ungrounded. At oh, the yeah, same yeah. time, it's a little bit self-indulgent to go, well, how do we get more diversity, right? Isn't it okay for us just to be whoever we are and whoever mm -hmm. shows up is whoever shows up. Mm -hmm. So like, how do we balance those things? That's where I start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, lots and lots of thoughts about that. I've actually been having similar conversations with people, like for instance, on um, Jeremy Johnson's mutation salon, like just yesterday, we were talking about things adjacent to this, adjacent enough that I was you know, that I found purchase into talking about it and from the angles that I'm trying to talk about it. So like the first one is like, is that question a genuine one, right? The question on behalf, on, on the part of like the guy lying awake at night trying to, fig <laughs> trying to figure out like how, why are our spaces so undiverse? What is it about my meta theories that just don't appeal to you know, or whatever. So is the question genuine, right? So like there's a there's a version of of that question that is less than genuine, which is just to say, my girlfriend cares about this. So I'm never gonna hear the end of it until I fix it. Right. So like, but I'm going to assume that most people are very genuine in 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 their in the authenticity of asking that question. Like why, you know, this does seem to be a problem. Why is it that like our space is just persistent? being tr like fair trending pretty white and pretty male i want to say before we go deeper into it that i have been noticing that the stoa is actually getting better on this metric that i've been noticing a lot more women leading conversations and a lot more um and i i'm failing at my own test of virtue right now which is i can't remember the, the name of the black man who was leading 
a conversation on the stoa and now i want to go look it up but let me just stay focused and maybe i'll figure it maybe i'll think of it later i don't hang out on the stoa all that much so i just sort of notice these things in passing like i'm somebody refers to me uh, benjamin wax refers to me as the 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 ranger of metamodernism like my i'm very aragorn like like I, I range from thing to thing and I go and I go off into the woods. Um, this is what I do professionally too. Uh, or at least somebody described me this way is that I go off into the woods with a piece of beef jerky and a hope and a prayer. And like, I may, I may come back with some like interesting, like I may have scouted out something or, or came back with a buck on my back or something like that. So, so I hop around from thing to thing, thing. So the main thing that I notice when I do this is what are the ways in which people are speaking? Uh, what are the, what's the like, what are, what's the lingo people are using? You know, do people, almost everybody has a code, right? Like that's why we have the term code switching, right? So like the code that you might use in these sort of stoic, stoicism oriented rooms is quite different from what you would use in like the integral salon type of area which would be quite different from if you went on 4chan you know there these are all different codes right so if i go on clubhouse and i poke around and i just notice like okay here's a room full of like phds who are mainly black or like doctors who are mainly women or something like that like how do they talk how do they what are the what what jingoistic at like aspects are they typically in Sconston. And I think what I'm finding primarily is that there's a lot less jingo in these spaces. <laughs> there's a lot less like less of like an intimidating lexicon that you sort of have to know if you are going to participate. There's much more of an emphasis on plain language um, and meeting people where they're at. Like the, not this presumption that you need to get on our level but rather, which I which I find predominates these, you know, so-called meta theory spaces. But rather that we're going to, you know, if somebody brings up a word that not everybody knows, which is going to happen on an hourly basis at least in these rooms, we're going to figure it out. Where that's less true is in the there's I'm noticing a rise in like Marxist theorists hanging out, especially in Twitter spaces. These are like people who are PhDs in one thing or another, or like can't PhD candidates. And they are very skilled at the use of like very recent feminist and Marxist theory in a way that would probably very much intimidate people coming from the spaces that possibly you and I are, are frequenting, right? So that's, that's what I'm gonna say is like the, the primary difference uh, or the primary exception. That's what I would say. Um, um, your yeah. invocation of um, non-specialist language uh, intrigues me because what I've noticed, like on the integral stage, we have a number of different types of interview series, mm. right? And in most of them, we get a couple of women and it's often a little bit harder to get them in a way. They're a little bit reluctant, but there's mm. been one series, which was our sexuality series, where it's 50% or more women. And they were very responsive to it. And we thought, oh, is there something about this topic, about the personalness of it mm. um, that was attractive? But almost all of them, when they came on, one of the first things they would say to me, even off camera, is, is it okay that I don't know the language? Mm -hmm. right? I'm aware of these things. I resonate with them a little bit, but I'm not really integral. I'm not really meta modern. They're trying to create a space in which they don't have to be technically in command of those terminologies. Right. Uh, and in a way that catches me a little bit off guard because I assume you don't have to be masters of that terminology, but mm. nonetheless, the impression of it is, I think, daunting in some ways. Sure. Because or, it's not just not daunting, something you want to clear away so that you uh, show up in a more relaxed sense where you don't have to worry about that. Right. Well, because it's not just about the the lingo and being potentially worried that you'll get it wrong or that, you know, you, you might show up like stereotype threat is a real thing, right? 
it may not, it doesn't apply evenly to all fields. Like the stereotype threat seems to go the other way in biology, where it's assumed that men aren't really good at squishy science, right? But in like, in my fields, um, like math, computer science, whatever, it's assumed that that women, if they're bad at that, it's a, it's a poor reflection on all of womanhood. Whereas that if, <laughs> if a man gets something wrong in the blackboard, it's like that XKCD comic, right? If a man gets something wrong in the blackboard, it's like, huh, you're kind of bad at this. But rather, if a woman gets something wrong on a Blackboard question, it's like, wow, women are bad at this, <laughs> right? So that's that's the characterization of stereotype threat. And it, um, I would say the stereotype threat is pretty bad for in like philosophical spaces. Um, and it's not because I assume that you or any other guy is thinking these thoughts, but rather that this is one of these default postures. Like when you see a very male very white space, the lack of representation of like having women and people of color, indigenous voices, et cetera, means that there is a there is an aesthetic that might lead to situations or an aesthetic that often can indicate that you should be worried about that, right? Whether it's true or not. Okay. So it's so and this is where I'm sure like a lot of people potentially listening to this or or whatever are like okay well then well we're not we don't intend that that's not that's that's not what's happening here right but you have to be aware that like this is a thing that's going on in people's heads that not being able to see women in conversation in these spaces ahead of time not being able to see people of color in these spaces ahead of time causes these sorts of like extra brain cycles to happen Right. So, okay. So here's the thing about that is that time is precious. That is the main thing that any of us have. Right. Uh, and where you spend your time is a precious thing as well. It happens to be true that white men have a lot more free time than anybody else. White men have way more time to immerse themselves in a, in a thing like the STOA or in becoming Wikipedia editors or whatever. This is not necessarily true for me. Um, but, uh, I also like, I have numerous privileges. Like I live in San Francisco. I've been able to make it as a software engineer and all sorts of things. Right. Those things tend to be less true for people of color and less true for women, right. That you just have a lot of free time to spend on things, which means that the likelihood that you're going to want to invest your time hanging out in the stoa, listening to two hour long podcasts that people are recommending to you is far lower. And as a result, I think people people who hang out in these spaces get a very bubbly disproportionate like out of proportion sense of what it is reasonable to expect from people who are, don't have that kind of free time or for whatever reason are even just slightly put off by it and would rather spend their time listening to people or listening to groups where the representation is higher for them where they can understand like, I don't know what it was about sexuality. I would love to hear more that you think that, you know, if you'd reflected on that at all. But when it comes, to, I think <clears throat> if you look at cho like choice behavior, if you look at decision making that is spread out statistically across a population, people will generally, even if it's just a tiny statistical difference in choice making, people will typically choose things that are a little bit more familiar to them than less familiar to them, right? And so I don't, uh, this is a tough problem is kind of what I'm saying. This is a, this is a, this is actually a wicked problem and it behooves people to like, think of it that way, a wicked problem on the, on the same scale as um, like homelessness, for example, you know, like getting people included in your space such that you can demonstrate to people who are like them that you have people included in your space is a difficult problem. <clears throat> Uh, there's a lot of things in there that I liked. Um, you know, I think one of the issues there is a kind of um, representational momentum where people mm -hmm. glance at spaces and if they see people like themselves, then they get more involved and that makes there be more people like them. And if they don't see a lot of people like themselves, they hold back. Right. And so the momentum can go in one of two directions. Right. It has mm -hmm. to be there in order to cause itself to be there. Right. Uh, the free time issue is interesting because, yes, there are uh, objective disparities in free time and um, between men and women. It's interesting between because um, women's brains often 
are more aware of actual larger numbers of things they have to take care of. At the same time, they also have um, a, a neuroemotional tendency to overthink some of the things they have to take care of. When right, so when you watch men and women interacting with each other in a relationship and what their different brain styles can contribute to each other, and these are like uh, stereotypical men and women, let's say. So stereotypical meaning most women are higher on agreeableness than men, like higher that kind on of agreeableness and better at tracking a multitude of concerns. Whereas men are a little bit more disagreeable and a little bit more tunnel visioned in. Yeah, I would need a goals. citation citation on that one. Like, I'll agree yeah, with sure. you that that women are stereotypically uh, more yeah, agreeable I'm, I'm, because that's been measured. Yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm really trying to say here is and also an ambiguity and by, and an by ambiguity consequence between um, how objectively more busy a person is and less sure. free time, well, and how much they're brain or their thought style or their emotional style causes them to feel like they are overwhelmed by things they have to take care of, well, even if they don't necessarily have less time. And the, right, both but, of those are in play. But check this out. People yeah. who are more agreeable agree to do more, do more things for other people. Mm -hmm. Right. So this idea that like women think they have more going on is you, you could be correct in saying that it is a problem of their own making to some degree. But also it is the case that men tend to be more disagreeable than women. Like, in other words, when people write, write business advice for women, they write it in a way such that they encourage them not to apologize for things or not to say yes to too many things. Da, 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 right. Because men have the opposite problem. Right. Sure. So uh, so I, I, I'm sort of partially agreeing with you in this roundabout way, but I'm not I'm not on board with this whole like. Women are like when Venus, men are from Mars. So well, I just want to like, not. I'm just, I'm drawing a line here. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I think. Cause I'm a, not like that. Yeah, exactly. I would say that I hear people talk about men and women like that a lot. And I've run into it a number of times in my own relationships where there are a certain subset of types of relationships. Right. Uh, but in the relationships I've had, it's easier for me to. Uh, not take as many things on board that I think aren't that important to work on. And then that leaves me with a bunch of free space. Now that's, that's a bias and an imbalance because a lot of the things, there are a lot of extra things that I should be taking more seriously to fill up my time that I'm pretending aren't as serious as they are. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if my girlfriend or previous girlfriends uh, bring things up, I always think, well, why, why even take, why are we even going to Christmas? Who cares? <laughs> Just let it go. Uh, and then you'd have a lot of free time for anything you wanted to think of. So part of that is absolutely a reality that, and part of it is subjective. And it's really hard to get a grasp on what that is. Sure. Uh, and I wonder how that plays into decisions about whether a person is going to agree or not agree to be on a podcast. And there's, there's some other things in there as well, right? Like uh, men or let's say masculine modalities, which could be in anybody, Mm -hmm. might be more likely to say, you know what? It does sound like a good idea that I should be front and center speaking on behalf of a set of ideas. Right. That might be fun, right? So it's 10% easier for them to think that would be fun. Right. Um, so Hence there's all the yeah. memes around that are just like, you know, why is it that men think that all of their, all the thoughts they have on the toilet deserve a microphone in front of their mouth? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Without overgeneralizing men and women too much, uh, there's a, like a lot of my stories, like a lot of my thinking connects to just moments from my own life. And I lived in this house where there were, we had a weekly poetry gathering, mm -hmm. right? And there were about equal numbers of men and women would come together and mm -hmm. the men would say, this is a poem. And the women would say, I don't know if this is a poem, but <laughs> I'm going to read it anyway. Right. And I sure. thought, Oh, the, the men are having the same experience, right? They look at their poem and they go, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to say it's a poem. Mm. And the women were looking at it and it, treating the same ambiguity as a reason to say, I'm not sure if this is a poem or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real. Yep. <laughs> that tends to be the case. It's true. Yep. So yeah, that contributes as well. It's like, okay, well, I don't really see women's voices in here, or even if you degenderize it, I don't see people in this space having or expressing ambiguity the way that I would. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When I say the way that I would, I'm not talking about myself, by the way. I'm putting myself in the shoes of 
you know, people who have that sort of thing about them that you just expressed about like poetry, right? And so that is a, but that is a thing that I find, in, especially in black heavy spaces and in <clears throat> female heavy spaces. And I don't know exactly what it is about the the black spaces, other than maybe that's just the way that they've, that's that's there there are cultural effects going on there. Um, I'm not black. I'm not going to speak for how black people are. I'm going to know. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say how what I things that I've noticed about other spaces, which is a greater comfort with speaking to ambiguity. Not everybody, right? Just like not all men and not all women, right? But this uh, this less less interest in speaking things definitively and more interest in just this like word jazz which is actually one of the things that okay now i'm gonna look look it up the guy on the stoa um it is in my watch history and it was really really good although i watch a lot of stuff was he mentioning jazz yes was it greg thomas yes that's his name i knew it was a g name (laughs) my brain brain files information but if I just say, yeah, that guy, G something, that's not really that helpful. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So Greg Thompson, he was really cool. And he had, a, there was a woman from Canada who was talking, uh, Judith? Why do I think of her as a Judith? Judith from Canada. <laughs> Might even not be her name. She just reminded me of a woman named Judith, perhaps. Um, Nora Bateson was on it. And maybe, I can't remember whether that was the entire panel. Um, but it was, it had a flow to it. It had a, it had a jazziness to it that I found refreshing. There's, um, there's an interesting thing there too, in the sense of the tendency that like we do a yin yonging thing in our brain and we tend to make these clusters that we associate with gender, Mm. right? So there's a lot of dualities we invent and then we then associate with masculine and feminine and, uh, right brain and left brain is one of those. Mm-hmm. And I think there are to- a lot more topics where, um, let's say, the left brain is describing how the right brain works, so to mm-hmm. speak, that are attractive to some of the, to me, more interesting female intellectuals, right? Nora Bateson, Benita mm-hmm. Roy. These people are very often coming on and they've got a very clear, very articulate, intellectually powerful way of talking about ambiguity and non-linearity and mystery and the fact mm-hmm. that our reasoning is not going to be able to encompass everything but they're excited about that they're willing to talk about that topic rather than oh, saying we know this stuff they want to talk about we know how we don't know stuff uh-huh <laughs> yeah um i think it's also important to note because i just did nora bateson's warm data course uh, sure. a few months ago with uh, my colleague Henry Andrews, who is going off and doing this um, hella metamodernism yeah. thing. Hashtag um, hella metamodernism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I'm, I'm, you know, I, he was he was overjoyed to find that you were immediately uh, trashing it. It was great. Like we were all just like, yeah, it's already popped. Yeah, I love Henry, and it's it's such a fun concept that it's immediately worth engaging with. Totally, and it's even better than it came. It like legitimately arose from an art project a few years ago kind of by accident but anyway oh flark i just did an h did an adhd what are, what are we talking about now um, oh oh norbit and i did warm yes. data course right, right people i think get an impression that they're that people like Nora Bateson have a lot more to say about uncertainty than they do about certainty but it's that's not quite it um, especially if you do the warm data course, it becomes quite apparent that there is a thrust to everything that she does. She does have certain ideas about like, and, I, and I'm using the word certain, not just like particular. She has particular ideas that are certain about, I would say more or less about how the world needs to be saved. Um, and they have to do with uh, sitting in conversation and sitting in uncertainty but that isn't to say that she doesn't have an idea of how things are going to go, right? I think it's it's difficult for me to even convey I, what I what I think that she's doing because I think that it 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 lacks it lacks a whole lot of linguistic uh, surround or enclosure. The only good word is aphanopoesis, which is one of the words that that Henry picked up for hella metamodernism. You, a few minutes ago, were intrigued by any guesses I might have about why there were more women engaged on the sexuality series than any of the other discussion series on yeah. the stage. 
Uh, and it's an open question, uh, right? It seems to me that the obvious guesses are they're more interested in talking about something that's more personal, more embodied, more energetic, more relational. Uh, I think some of it has to do probably with the fact that there's a lot of women in that field, so to speak, right? If it's neo-tantra or Buddhist mm. sexuality or something like that, mm. they, they happen to have already been attracted to those topics. And so they mm. are there to be uh, discussed with. Got it. Uh, uh, right, those right, are my right. top two obvious guesses, but I'd love to dig into it a little bit more because I'm just not sure. Um, I'm not totally sure either. There is a there is a very palpable way in which um, I have had to discover my own femininity, like kind of recently, recently meaning the past decade. Not like a I'm, week ago. <laughs> I'm in my I'm in my 40s now, so like you know, recently can mean any of my 30s, basically, which is when it, when I did that um, because of how far distant I felt from the rest of uh, womanhood. So so it's hard for me to just kind of go like, oh, well, it's probably like this, right? Like. I, I feel very, um, I, I feel like it would be conjecture rather than me identifying. Go ahead and conjecture, given those caveats. Well, I mean, there's the physical reality of there being like different, you know, different tools being represented in different bodies, right? I'm trying to avoid being obscene, right? <laughs> on your podcast. But like people with different equipment know how to use things differently and so if you come into a space and you have like like uh, you know i've been using this tool for my entire life and you have a completely different tool right and just this understanding that like that you are going to at least be seen as the expert in who you are mm -hmm. right physically speaking or like you know emotionally speaking or in your experience of it right because this is the thing that i think is so frequent about uh, heavily white male dominated spaces and the the word colonial colonialism is used i think pretty accurately which is that there is this tendency to th for men white men in particular to think that they've got things figured out for all of humanity when they don't or when they don't have when they have not actually absorbed even a tiny fraction of human experience, right? Like, oh, we found something universal based on my cohort of college students at Princeton. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I checked with Chet, Biff, and Mike, and they all agree. That's right, right, right. We all found something very universal about the fact that, like, when we clock out at 4 p.m., we all smoke joint, you know, and then we get hungry. Like, this is just something that all of humanity does, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. And it, like, obviously, it's not to say that like psychedelic experiences are like unique to like, you know, uh, privileged white dudes sitting on a couch college, like, you know, but there, we are still undoing a lot of the um, sociological, psychological, behavioral science, etc. Possibly not undoing, but rather recharacterizing a lot of the stuff that, like, still people refer back to, like the Stanford Prison Experiment, and there's a bunch of other ones that I, um, that basically things that have been reconsidered, um, because again, there's this tendency to to rely too heavily on the authoritative nepotism of academia to say, well, we've thought about it a whole bunch, and we all know that we publish papers, and we all like each other's papers, therefore we've got it all figured out now or at least we're on the right track without having included any of women's experiences like it wasn't that long ago that like that the word hysteria like hysterical was used to like as a medical diagnosis for women's menstrual cramps you know what i mean it's like all in your head clearly because we don't have any women doctors like investigating anything because women aren't allowed to be doctors you know but that was not long ago <laughs> So it's again, it's like not to say that like people like yourself don't have other intentions for like how things should go like, ah, like we should, you know, we should consider women's experiences. Right. But there's a ways to go because because you need this kind of like critical mass of, of representation within 
these conversational spaces, whatever your conversation has to be about, like it happens to be about, especially if it has to do with the human experience, such that whatever you come up with is recognizable to somebody that's outside of that conversation as like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I get what you're putting down. I'm interested in human experience and you guys are talking about human experience as opposed to, oh, wow, that's a lot of big words that you guys invented that I, I know kind of what you're getting at, but it doesn't really seem like there's a place for me. So there's a question coming up for me around how, uh, how particular the universal should be mm. right? because we go, look, we're, we come out of anybody's a type of person, a type of organism that come out of a background and you go, well, do I have to migrate to and think in terms of being a universal human being in order to be more than just my specific identity or is that universality attained by me sinking more deeply into and inhabiting more completely my particular identity, mm. right? And if it's the latter, then shouldn't people be sort of like, let's say you have a bunch of um, white male meta intellectual talking heads, shouldn't they be embracing that more if the particular is the universal or should they be trying to take a stance that is outside of what they are in the hopes that it will welcome other types? Right, right, right. Yeah, I th I've actually, I was thinking about this earlier today, which is what reminded me to like reach out to you about this particular dialogue, which is that the, the conclusion or the, 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 the place that we might end up needing to go next is just acceptance that these spaces are actually particular hmm. and that lying awake at night <clears throat> while your girlfriend worries that you're thinking about other women, um, but you're really worrying about like, how do we get the black people or whatever is not actually going to like move the needle in any particular way. And that it's, it might actually be okay for people to just kind of double down on self-discovery and to do so when you're, you know, schools put people together. I, I don't mean schools like, um, necessarily like age level schools, but like schools traditionally have put people together by developmental level, right? Because these are all the people that need to be grouped together because they're on the same similar journey, right? So, you know, when I look at somebody like Jordan Peterson, for example, by the way, I we just agreed yesterday in the mutation salon that like we all have to put a quarter in the, in the jar every time we say Jordan Peterson, because we don't actually <laughs> really want to talk about him that much. It's kind of like it's, you know, it's like, uh, all right, so little, it's a tiny little penalty every time. But anyway, um, but like that people who really like swear by Jordan Peterson and whenever you have a critique of Jordan Peterson and it's kind of like the immediate response is, well, you haven't read every single thing he's ever written. You haven't, you haven't watched all of his videos. It's like, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, well, I'll see you on the other side of whatever journey it is, it is that you're on, right? There, clearly, there's a journey that some people need to go on, right? And this is why I don't worry my little head about it, right? Like men's rights activism type stuff. I'm just like, and, and I'm not equating. Uh, it was just, it's just another thing that popped into my head. Or like people who think that Andrew Bard is the shit. I think he comes up with really funny things to say, and I think he's kind of interesting but there are some people who are like oh this is what we need right now we need a concept of the chief the matriarch and the sage and we need to double down on freudian psycho psychoanalysis like that's that's the thing right <laughs> and, and maybe like, that is the next step for them at right this moment. Yeah. right maybe that's the next step for them does that mean we should get more pull more black people into dialogue with andrew bard i'm not so i don't know i don't think so Right. And I, I also don't I don't know that that would be good for anybody in particular, but I think it is worthwhile to notice who is not showing up to your conversations. Right. And, and not showing up means different things, because mm -hmm. you know, when I've been in conversations where somebody else is raising a question like, where are the integral women? Right. And then I'm checking and I'm like, well, she's upstairs. I, I'm down here on the computer and she's upstairs. Right. And we're going to talk about this later, just mm. like we talked this morning. And that's right. informing this discussion. So there's a sense in which people are in the conversation who you don't see in the conversation. Yes. And that definitely does tend to be women. Right. So like this ongoing project of sociology and philosophy is to uncover 
Like who were who were the women hosting the parties that people went to when they talked about this stuff and then later wrote a paper, right? Because that that tended to be women's work and it also tended to be unrecognized, right? So you would occasionally get a mention of somebody who was important to the conversation or that hold, hosted a good salon in the Renaissance or whatever. Um, and everybody would want to come to their gathering for some reason, right? Like this, there's a, there's an effort that went into for them that went into the curation of the conversation, but that's not what ends up getting written down and remembered. Like, you know, so that is to say, so yes. Oh, uh, and another thing about that, um, there is an interview with, I am going to get the name in a second, um, guy who wrote a book about like how the, how the hippies uh, turned into uh, libertarian capitalists, essentially. So like the communal, that, you know, tune in, drop out, we're going to go form a commune in the hills thing that nobody in the liminal Dow space seems to remember uh, that happened. That's, you know... W- all we need to do is get the right people together and we're going to, you know, go into some kind of like fi- financial commitment with each other and everything's going to work out fine. Well, in the 70s, it did not work out so fine. A lot of these spaces collapsed some, somewhat horrifically. Yeah. But the, the thing that is, uh, oh, Fred Turner, it's Fred Turner. Um, there's a podcast on The Dig, which is what, the Jacobins podcast where you can listen to it's really, really good. It's one of the few two-hour podcasts that I've listened to all the way through. It's just consistently really good. Fred Turner. So, um, so Fred Turner talks about how, um, you know, when he goes back and like interviews people about how did these spaces fail, you know, when he finally talks to women, the women were like, oh yeah, the men were always in the room like talking about stuff, and we were like actually washing people's socks and making soap and cooking dinner and cleaning up. <laughs> It's like, where are the integral women? Well, they're probably, probably doing laundry. Yeah. Unfortunately, and it's and it's kind of like, you know, again, like you were saying earlier, and I, you know, I'm still a little bit like I, I there's a bit of me that's kind of like, you know, maybe maybe think think a little bit more about this, but like women do tend to be more agreeable, which is to say, you know, if I handle the planning of going to Christmas, then it'll all just go off. And years from now, people will thank me for maintaining family connections, right? That people are may not may not be understanding is an important thing to do. Right. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, where are the women like doing stuff that is frequently unrecognized? Yeah, and I wonder about like here's a very practical question, which is um a friend of mine uh, reached out to me at New Year's and we talked a little bit and he said, no, his wife wants to know, wants you to have more women on the integral stage. And I thought, I don't know if she knows how many women are on the integral stage. Mm-hmm. Right. So then I thought, well, yes, we want to do that. And at the same time, we don't want to be too identified with trying to do that. But what if we took all the women from all the different interview series and put them together in a category of interview. We're like, these are the interviews with women. Now Mm. that there's something perverse about that, right? Mm Because that doesn't seem like it's a real category, Um, (laughs) right? It seems like you're trying way too hard at that point. At the same time, if his wife comes in and goes, oh, there's a bunch of women. She sees that and goes, oh, a bunch of women are here. Yeah. So, like, we have to make that decision in a very practical sense about whether to do that, and uh, I'm just think, not sure. So, my initial reaction is is a questionable one, and it's uh, it's personal growth that tells me this. So, my initial reaction is anti group and anti uh, like, oh, that's like that's for women. I don't want to do it. I was a tomboy, so knowing that most women are not like me, and knowing that um, there are not that many women who are like me. I think you should do that okay. because more women, <laughs> I think, will appreciate that. Given that it wouldn't necessarily be appealing to you, it might be appealing to all the other women. That's right. Okay, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, while we're here, I have, like I have a general curiosity about what you think you see too much of in these discussion spaces that we're in, and what do you feel like you're not seeing enough of? 
Mm, okay. So several thoughts. So number one, I think people don't necessarily, oh, by the way, when you say these discussions, I don't necessarily know what you're No, it is to, ambiguous. <laughs> right. So like, I don't, I don't know about what is typical on the integral stage. Like I said, I'm, I'm more of a ranger than yep. a paladin. I don't, <laughs> I go and I range. And so like, I take a little bit of from, from everything. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I feel like is typical that I think is an anti-pattern sure. uh, for white male spaces, which is to constantly refer back to a couple of two or three people within a first, the first few minutes of the stoa, somebody will mention Daniel Schmackenberger. So, and I, so it's, it's silly enough to me that I have called, like I've named it something, which is time to Daniel Schmachtenberger. It's the TDS metric. So like, so I'm, I basically just, Oh, that one had a two minute. So that one was 15. That wasn't so bad, you know, but the thing is that if, if it is important to constantly reference one person, especially a person who is, you know, representative of the demographic that, you know, you would, you you may have a problem with the fact that like oh like we all look we all look like this guy then you can do much better and you could be much more authentic and intentional sorry authentic isn't the right word you can be much more intentional about who you choose to bring into the conversation and that's the thesis of this article that i'm writing called citation as an act of creation because when you choose to source somebody you are bringing in a source of representation that potentially other people can follow up on. For example, like on the Future Fossils podcast, um, Michael Garfield is really good about writing out a list of like what was mentioned in that, in that podcast. Other podcasters do this too. I think Jim Rott does this pretty well. But it makes it so that you can, you can go and you can follow up. Like, oh, you mentioned like Melanie Mitchell. That's really cool. Like, I, I don't know who this Melanie Mitchell is person. And then you can go find out that she wrote a book about about genetic algorithms that was like super pivotal and like actually drag, like actually inspired a lot of the people who are now in complexity science. But without, without remembering to mention people um, that are not just the typical people that you mention, people that don't look like you from different backgrounds than you, then you're just like continually reinforcing the same, the same patterns, right? Like the same, like, okay, well, like this guy, is an American and is a white male and is fairly well off and has these certain thought patterns. And like, you just keep on referring back to that person. He becomes in like a, you know, if you're familiar with like different network patterns, this is like a star topology, right? You've got a node at the center and it branches yeah. outwards. But I think even Daniel Schmachtenberger would probably admit that he would prefer more of a web topo topology, which is um, something that I've heard Nora Bateson talk about. It's more of like a, <laughs> I hate to use the word, but it's decentralized. <laughs> Everyone's like, decentralized is better. You know, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. And Moxie Marlin Spike has a really good talk about that. But decentralized in terms of sense making, I think is vastly superior to this, like, you know, we have these like chiefs of sense making that we constantly refer out to. So would you be interested more in a uh uh, in people trying to uh, or making sure that they don't lean too far into this uh, small handful of people like themselves who are currently prominent references for thought so that they can open up those networks or more interested in having everybody um, be more self-aware about the way that they relate to those things. Well, it's both, right? Um, so if you have the, per the guy lying awake at night in that meme, thinking, how do we get more women and people of color into these spaces? Like, to me, uh, th this, is, this is what I would say is the action item is number one, go out to other people, other spaces, like go find the anarchist Afrofuturists club on Clubhouse and listen to how they talk. Uh, and also asterisk, they don't want you to talk in there, by the way. They're not really a fan of white men, but um, or white people in general. But I just go into like, listen, like, how do you how do you guys talk? What those people talk about is so much more to me, like boots on the ground game B than anything that I've heard from the game B space. 
And so when I like came back from that journey into the woods, into a faraway land and brought that back to people, I was just like, oh, oh, it's really exciting. They're talking about like how you sh- we should just be like developing new, like novel economic ne- ne- networks in plain sight work around the existing system, parasitize the existing system, right? But anyway, if you never explore, then you won't have anything to bring back to the group, right? Like just because you, you know, the STOA or whatever, you know, whatever group or like whatever, you know, three hours of Daniel Schmachtenberger riffing at you, if just people are just bringing back into the group what's already in the right. group, then they're not providing any nourishment. The bees have to go further afield. Totally. Yeah. Right, right, right. And so if you actually take your cues and sustenance and take take and actually branch out into like what is novel and potentially challenging, um, bring that back to the group and be like, hey, I found this thing. And talk about it. Right. And so maybe every once in a while, instead of going like, and then the other day, Daniel Schmackenberger said, blah, 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 blah. You can say, oh, and then the other day I was in Clubhouse and I was listening to some black MDs talk about vaccines and how they get black people to, you know, understand the value of medicine in the context of a, you know, several hundred years of, you know, some really horrific shit that's been done to black people, right? If you just substituting, I think here and there, I think might actually help a lot. So this would be like my number one recommendation. And then what goes with that is like noticing when you're too comfortable, noticing when things make like a whole lot of sense. Like, oh, man, it's just, I just need to like, I, I don't know how it works for people, but like, um, you know, I'm just going to like lie down on the couch and just like listen to one of my favorite chiefs of sense making, you know, because like, I just need to be reminded of what all the problems are and you know, in a certain way, in this kind of like poetic way that this particular person spins it. Like there's nothing wrong with like soul food. Like I would consider that soul food, but like if all you're eating is soul food, you get fat. (laughs) Yeah. Guilty pleasures shows that uh, (laughs) don't necessarily challenge you, but it's, that's okay. They don't all have to challenge you, but you should be aware of those differences. I'm certainly in a lot of conversations where it's, there's a slight pain in my heart at how well we get along and agree about things. It should. No, it should feel wrong. (laughs) It should feel wrong because if you, you know, if you are, dare I say, pretentious enough to say that you're creating meta theory, then you should be aware that, especially if you're thinking on an integral kind of, kind of way, like you should be aware that a lot of parts of you are, should be objecting to what is happening because it wasn't, it's not like how you were raised and it's not your favorite religion. And by religion, I'm including things like listening to Jordan Peterson, for example, I consider him a priest, you know what I mean? Like, and by the way, that wasn't about you. (laughs) Um, Just had to disclaimer that like, you know, there, there are people that I listen to like as, as, as priests that make me feel good. But like, I think that if you are, if you are on the, the verge or like on the precipice of some of describing something that makes sense for humanity. I honestly don't think it should feel perfect for you. Like, I think that if it's, if it's going to work well enough such that it encompasses, uh, now I'm pulling back on my statement. It's like, I don't think there's an it. I think there are going to be several, several different descriptions, right? If you're talking about like meta theory, meta theorizing, how humans can relate to each other, make sense of things, find meaning, whatever. But I, I don't believe that you can come up with overarching theories about how to make meaning and purpose and all that kind of stuff without ending up feeling slightly uncomfortable about it. But that's, that's a belief. I can't back that up with, you know, facts. No, there's, <laughs> there, there's a number of good philosophical and psychological reasons to agree with that, I think. Uh, I mean, one is that we're we're never going to know. One is that the integration itself operates at the intersection between multiple perspectives. And so there's always going to be a friction in that overlap zone. If you're being present at all to the possibility of meta spaces, then you have to be showing up in the liminal areas between impulses and mindsets 
Mm -hmm. And those are going to be pulling on each other. So you should be feeling some kind of ambiguity and friction mm -hmm. if you're in the spot where metaspaces should actually emerge. Something like that. Yeah. And so um, it, it also, I feel like, tends to be the case, just historically speaking, that people who have experienced more oppression and struggle are in a better position to actually have better solutions to, 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 to be feeling the urgency for themselves of like how how like how to figure the next thing out whatever's in front of us right and so it actually makes little sense to me why americans white americans would be on the precipice of figuring anything out that is like of use to the entire world they're not the group <laughs> you would guess might have the answer <laughs> no no like i honestly i am too comfortable Right. Like I have a lot of time to like spend like just shooting the shit with you about like, oh, what's wrong with our meta theories or whatever. Meanwhile, the global south is like experiencing real effects of climate change. They're like trying to figure out like how do we purify water because it matters tomorrow. It matters right now. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more struggle happening in other parts of the world. And therefore, like the Twitter spaces where I find black phds talking about like doing material analysis in real time for like hours on end essentially and there are people i can i can point you to that you can follow on twitter if you want to sort of just like dip in from time to time but they're all they're spread out over the world largely in more global south kind of areas um also a few people at oxford too which um may like kind of draws the conversation upwards into this like ac heady academic space but they're all on the same level and they're all basically going like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the material analysis of, you know, like Palestine, material analysis of Egypt. Um, they're pulling it all together. They're, they're thinking globally in a material way, in a way that I don't hear people who are honestly like, like white people like us who are like too comfortable, to be honest, even talking. <laughs> I think the, the, there's an additional piece of that, which is preparation for future destabilizations and that people That's are right. very comfortable. It's hard. Like I've tried, been trying to set up this thing called Ontario depth adaptation, right? Because I'm in Ontario and there's a lot of nice. advanced thinkers here. And I'm like, why are those thinkers not spending at least half their time working on actual disaster preparation or how to really support each other in real life? And it's very difficult to get these people to think regionally to think in mm -hmm. an embodied way even though they speak about embodiment very well and i think in some ways they haven't experienced enough turmoil personally or historically totally to viscerally anticipate that turmoil is coming we know turmoil is coming there are so many radical disruptors already in play that something is going to happen civilization wise and ecology wise one way or the other we're mm -hmm. not really preparing for it because we're not even though we verbally acknowledge it, we're not acting like it's serious. Nope. And other people who've gone through some more shit than we have might be better at acting like it's serious. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard to like, it's hard to like overstate what you just said, right? Like, you know, people, a lot of people are surprised by the way that like Arab spring was actually a, a, an after effect of like climate change, essentially. Like it came in the wake of like an intense famine, because of like rising temperatures and the decrease of actual arable, arable farmland. Um, and people just kind of like took that out on the government. I mean, for tons of other reasons, but like, these are the things that catalyze revolutions. It's like, well, we don't, we're not comfortable anymore. So like, what do we have to lose? <laughs> right? Like our fam my family can't eat, like it's fine to risk death now. Right. And there's going to be a lot more happening that in places where we don't have like these fallback bread baskets, like we do in the United States. Like I live in California, we could freaking secede from the union and we'd probably be fine. And not even every state in the United States could say that. So the degree of privilege that I'm sitting on, like wildfires not necessarily, you know, withstanding, makes it so that I have discovered that I've discovered this as a huge point of discomfort, I guess, for myself, which is that when I when I walk into these spaces that where I feel like there's a lot of nodding and agreement, like we're figuring this shit out. And I go, you're not talking about anything that's about to happen or how urgent it is. It 
I'm just I'm experiencing this growing cognitive dissonance where I'm like, what can I do? And to me, like the only thing that I know that I could potentially influence in 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 the conversation and various conversations and dialogues is to use my privilege to walk into these spaces because I understand the dialogue and whatnot and say, you need to be listening to these people over here. <laughs> That's a really useful function, right? Mm. Because I think the the ideas that I've expressed, which is, you know, I'm in these communities where people are doing all this kind of thinking and then they come around to these spots kind of like I instantiated in that meme where they wonder about what they're not including. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so they're, they're they're open to that, <laughs> and and it's clear what we're not including to some degree, right? Um, ethnically, um, gender wise, preparation wise, historically, there's a lot of things we're not taking seriously enough, but we need people to be able to have that on hand, right? Like you're saying, you go like, look, here's I can point you directly to what you should be including. That's an extremely useful function, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you for the encouragement. And it's also difficult because a lot of these things, these conversations, especially when it comes to people of color, tend to be ephemeral. I do find that they that they are vibing more in these sort of like transitory, like very warm data spaces, to be honest, and less in the sort of like, I need to write an article about this, or like, I need to give a presentation about my opinions, right? And so just as there is a bias towards thinking that the Greeks invented civilization because so much of their shit is written in marble, right? And we can discover it and learn about it and whatnot. It's the same with what we're talking about here, which is that there's a bias towards thinking that, that white people are, are continually inventing civilization and they're the only ones really working on it because of how many artifacts are being created. And I, I'm finding that there are fewer artifacts being created in the in the conversation of like that is I'm just going to refer to it as the global south. Sure. Yeah, I could uh, be wrong about that. I really hope I, I'm wrong about that. And I, well, would like, I hope you're I, wrong, too, but I fear you might be right. And I I look at myself and I I'm torn like. So I wrote this article the other day on my Substack about apocalyptarians, right? Yeah, it was then they got reposted on the intellectual dark web, and then the Stoa asked if I want to come on and talk about it. So it, it's 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 orbiting in this thing, but I almost didn't write it because every time I go to write something now, I think, yeah, maybe I should just make a meme or maybe <laughs> I should just talk to my girlfriend about it. Like I I have no sure. confidence at all at writing that writing these things down is in any way a step forward or a useful mm. function even though i'm good at doing that i i think of things in that form and i tend to want to output them in that sense and yeah. obviously they trigger certain other people to embrace it but i can't see what it's doing or why i wouldn't do it in some other form entirely Sure. Yeah. No, I fight with myself on this level a lot. Um, I haven't actually produced a lot of particular writing and I'm, I actually have to like push myself to do it. I tend to be good at holding spaces in that very like, you know, tends to be female type of way, like holding conversations. Like I have a discord, for example, which anybody, if they send me a request to jump on, totally welcome to jump on. Um, we hold a lot, like the point of that discord tiny, tiny little pitch because it doesn't make anybody any money or move the needle on anything in particular. It's just interesting. It's like, I wanted a place for people to have long form conversations that take days, weeks, or even months to unfold. So we have like a channel that's just about egregores. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly what we were talking about, but like, it's been interesting, right? Or like a channel about like, you know, metamodernism, for example, is another one, um, which has now been taken over by hella metamodernism, which is great. But anyway, it's just, a, you know, if anybody on your in your channel would like to would like to jump on it, I'm happy to have more and more people who are just like interested in having long form conversations. But anyway, the point is, like, I haven't created a lot of artifacts, but I, I simply but partially it's because I have that same sense of like, what's the point of this? Like, how does this do anything? Like, if I'm just I'm just speaking like. Who am I trying to convince when I say X, Y, and Z? Like, how does this help? Like, oh, goody, I've like figured out a new like chart about how to like visualize, I don't know, how churches interrelate with hippies or something. I don't know. I just pulled that out of my butt. Um, <laughs> like, you know, or like, 
postmodernism versus metamodernism, like, you know, these like charts and graphs and stuff like that. It's like, what is this? I'm not really sure what any of this does. Partially, it's like speaking to the converted and partially I've like kind of like nicknamed a lot of this stuff, their philosophy red light district. You know, it's the place where you go just kind of like feel good about the idea that you're like pondering the meaning of life. But then you go home and like material conditions haven't actually changed in any way, shape or form. <laughs> There's, um, you know, egregores is interesting because it um, connects with the occult and the magical. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was just on Scout Leader Wiley's thing the other day on her metamodern, metamodern magic thing. We're going to cool. do a whole series on each of the chakras. Hmm. But the the idea of magic and of the intuitive and the nonlinear and different ways of processing information and affecting the world, it seems like that's a little bit like, where are the women? Where are the black people? Sort mm. of question, right? Because it's not, it's not a type of person, but mm. it's a type of thinking that we might not be including enough, right? It's the kind of thing that you might get a nominal mention from a Schmachtenberger about, <laughs> but you don't hear him doing magical incantations or freeform poetry. What you hear is a very analytical overview of the situation. So I'm curious what you think about the types of thought that we might not be allowing into these spaces adequately. Um, Allowing is an interesting word to use. (laughs) For I Um, am the gatekeeper of the meta space and I will allow or disallow. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. So here's the thing. Like I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily put it on the stoa to like, you know, hold like some kind of like magical ritual or whatever um i've seen them branching out like they have different like shows or whatever that they do that are you know i forget what one of them was like the embodiment hour or something like that like i checked that out for a little bit so like clearly they're like doing different different things but a venue is a venue for a reason right like you hold a salon so that you can like invite people to like have high flute and conversations maybe play the piano Right. And just like, ha ha ha, I like drink tea. Right. Like this is the, these things are, these things are magic incantations, just like everything else is. Right. So when I say, when you say things like, you know, maybe what, what are we not allowing? It's more like, what are we not mapping in? Really? What are we not recognizing? Right. So like scout leader Wiley is doing this, this really cool thing where she's declaring that like, Hey, I'm aligned with this metamodernism, game B, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to do this jazz and I'm going to do it over here with this like tarot. And I don't know if she does tarot, but I'm, I'm, okay, great. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Batting a hundred or a thousand, whatever. I don't do, still don't really do sports. So she, yeah, but she's like basically kind of linking herself in, right. And not saying, Hey, you guys should, you know, you're not doing X, Y, and Z, but rather going, um, I'm in your zone and here's what I'm doing. So you're invited over here. Right. So having more of that and all, honestly, all you need to do is just not say no, yeah. you know, like not kind of like Im- immediately like bat it down and go like, well, that's like, that's a bunch of woo stuff, you know, which some parts of what is known as the liminal web will tend to do. Right. That's too woo woo. All you have to do is not say no. I like that. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. It's simple and obviously doesn't, you know, encompass everything we're talking about, but the, it, it, it applies to so many things when we're talking about absorbing because you can't possibly go, hey, I don't think I'm including enough things. I'm going to therefore include all the things I'm not including. That's not an option. You can't do it that way. No. The only things you can include are things that are actually coming up for you in your life through your encounters or through other people. And so your job is mostly to not neutralize them. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, And I think not to get too hung up on like you said, like what you're not doing or what you're not including. But there are ways in which, like as I alluded to earlier, there are ways in which it might behoove this particular scene to 
make mention of and be a little bit more open to including just just when you talk about things like hey here's what scout leader wiley is doing or like hey like here's what um now i, I need to know her name uh the person who was in conversation with greg thomas um here's what greg thomas is doing for example but pulling these in like and saying here's what's important about them rather than constantly making mention to these basically like these hubs at the in a spoke of a wheel, which is just how I visualize it. Mm, there's a there's a kind of repeated theme here in this discussion of um you know more diversity and balance in the referencing that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And just again, it's just like providing paths for people to follow. Um and it, it can be really, really difficult. Like, number one, as I said, like, I think a lot of the, like, really out there stuff tends to be more ephemeral and not necessarily making as many artifacts for reasons that you alluded to earlier as well. Like, men, white men in particular, tend to want to, like, record a podcast or, you know, make an article or thing, things like that. But, uh, oh, yeah, the, the other problem is um, I think that the pandemic has increase the number of long form conversations that are being published. Mm -hmm. And it's actually just quite difficult to know how people should honestly spend their time. Like if I go, Oh my gosh, that was a great, like two hour podcast that I just listened to. I can't even share that with my boyfriend. Most of the time He's like, why is this worth my time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want me to put a couple hours into this? <laughs> yeah. So I think that there's like a huge niche at this point that has been created by the fact that people have had so much free time to create more artifacts in the past couple of years, or certain people have had more free time to create more artifacts. Parents certainly haven't. Now there's a market niche for things that are more like 99% invisible that are shorter and like, you know, have a point as opposed to just being like, you know, a conversation like this, where it's like, let's just record and see what happens. Like that's, which obviously there's a place for that. Some people like that, but I think I think what's about to happen next, if I'm going to do like sort of like a market prediction for the for the uh, the philosophy right red light district, is that there's going to be a lot more fast food being created, yeah. like curational, like oh here's a snippet from this, here's a snippet from this, here's what you need to know, move on. No, we we think about that a lot. Like uh, you know, if it weren't just Bruce is producing this. <laughs> And I'm doing the talking part for the most part. But if we had a third person doing it, that person's job would be to extract pieces that sounded exciting for a mm. couple of minutes, right? And promote those. And we're not sure how important that is or isn't. It obviously is effective to do that. And it may definitely be what's coming. At the same time, how much of the degraded information ecology that we live in is a result of people doing that, right? This sort of standard news move of giving you a quick summary, whereas right. it may be that you don't actually get informed unless you put that time in. Uh, there is a middle ground, which is press releases. Mm. Like this is how science produces snippets that it wants the media to know. Right. So like some scientific paper comes out, it's like way too complicated for anybody to like really make sense of. So what We've they discovered do is they, gravitational waves. Right, right, all the yeah. media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like <laughs> perpetual motion machine, you know, whatever. And then the media says, like, okay, well, like, what's the like what are the two sentences that the top scientist on this paper had to say about this about this experiment? Like, what are the other things that we needed to know? Right. So you know, maybe that's a little bit of a more upfront work from somebody like you who's like recording these conversations. But the end result is that somebody who is doing this more like curational thing can, will have like maybe a couple of time codes or something like that, right? So like, you know, hear what Naomi said at like time code blah, right? And then it lasts this long. Like, you know, basically it's, you're, you're what this is what press releases do, right? Like they help marketers make sense of things because marketers don't have a lot of time yeah. either. Right. No, I think um, more attention to breaking these things down. And we don't do this yet on our series, which is put that extra work into saying what goes on in what chunks. It's an attractive thing, but uh, obviously it's a lot of extra time and work to do that to some degree. Uh, it would be nice. We want to know a lot of extra. Work. We want to know how, uh, 
how long it takes anyone to mention Schmackenberger. <laughs> it, was, it was 50 minutes into our discussion before you brought him up. <laughs> so people yeah. should know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my fitness goal for the month is to get that number bigger. <laughs> Intellectual fitness. <laughs> well, my guess is we're coming near the end of this discussion. Yeah. I got other shit to do. Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> anything else you want to mention before we go? Anything on your mind in your life? <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's, what's one thing I don't know about Naomi that I should? Oh, gosh. There's so many things. One thing. Oh. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm like a person in my 40s with ADHD. There's so many fucking things. I was only diagnosed this past year. How about that? <laughs> uh, what chemicals did they give you? Uh, methylphenidate. Yeah. Concerta. Yeah. I'm experimenting with it. I don't necessarily want to yeah. want to take it every single day. Is it um, uh, working? Like what, what's the effect it's having on you? It's hard to say because it, because I'm still so random about like how much I sleep. Right. Um, so I'm still trying to like dial it in, but like when it's like, I've gotten the sleep and I take, and I take this in the morning, then I, I'm able to last longer on boring tasks that I just have to do. Um, and since I'm in school full time, there's a lot of boring stuff that I have to do that is kind of how it is. So, yeah, sorry. It's like, I don't know. I, that was like the least interesting thing that I feel like. I could have brought up. Uh, I have over bring, bring up one more. Thing. I, have a, I have under over a hundred animals living in my apartment. How about that? That sounds <laughs> preposterous. <laughs> I mean, a large portion of them are snails and shrimp. Okay. Yeah, and to, uh, ice shrimp. Yeah, snails. I get. I've seen people with snails. You have shrimp and isopods too. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I I like. I don't know. They're so cute. So I. I find different varieties of them, especially outside in Golden Gate Park, which I live really close to. And then I put them in a terrarium and I, I pick out the ones that I think have the cutest, you know, color, color morph. Like I've got a bunch of them that are like lavender and yellow that are in this terrarium that I built during the pandemic. And uh, it's, it's, it's a nice terrarium too. Like I've been growing all these little plants in there and then I've got lights on it on a bookshelf. And then they grow and I get to watch them eat. Like if I put a little piece of carrot in there and they go nibble, 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 nibble. Oh. And if I blow on them, they're like, ah, <laughs> you run away. Well, this is uh, fantastic, Naomi. It's very <laughs> lovely to get to know you. And, yeah. uh, I appreciate the engagements I see you making online and the uh, intellect and acumen and sensibility and passion that you're bringing to a number of different topics. Uh, I appreciate you talking with me about this and I'd love if we could figure out some excuse to talk again sometime. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I uh, really appreciate the levity that you're bringing with your uh, Pascal's integral bat cave. I, um, I just feel like a lot of these spaces are like too, too serious, take themselves way too spirit, too seriously. It's it's fun to like, it's fun to see you memeing the, memeing the space, appropriately. <laughs> <laughs>